The following presentation is designed to act as a guide in the operations and procedures of Somerset houseboats. By following these examples, you will help to ensure that you are operating your craft in the most functional, efficient, and safety-oriented manner. For further information, you may refer to your owner's manual or contact your Somerset representative. When preparing for departure, the following steps should be observed. Upon entering, proceed to the cockpit area and flip the blower switch to on. Then go to the rear of the craft, raise the engine hatches, and check for fuel leaks, water, or dangerous fumes. Check all fluid levels in the engines and generator, including the oil, power steering fluid, antifreeze, gear lubrication, and the battery water level. This visual check is critical before operation of any houseboat. Leave the engine hatches open until you are ready for departure. This ensures that most of your fumes escape from the engine hatches during the initial startup. Now you may return to the helm station and continue your checklist procedures. After your blower has been engaged for a minimum of four minutes, you may prepare to start your engines. Insert the keys into the ignition panel. There will be one or two of these depending on the number of engines on the craft. For this demonstration, we will be utilizing a two-engine vessel. These particular controls are the MMC electronic shifters. Other shifters are the hydraulic shifter and the manual cable shifter. All three of these are different in their operation. The starboard key activates the starboard shifter. Just press the black button once to engage, and you must continue to depress it while moving the starboard shifter. This drops the gear and gives you warm-up throttle only. As long as the red light is flashing, the craft is in the neutral throttle position. You then repeat the process with the port shifter. Once again, depressing the black button and continuing to hold it until the engine power is engaged. As long as the red lights are flashing, you are in throttle only. No gears are engaged. Remember, the starting procedures will vary from craft to craft depending on your particular vessel. Refer to your owner's manual for any variations in starting procedures. When the engines are engaged, we must monitor our temperatures. The engines will heat to a running temperature in the 140 to 190 degree range depending on the engine type and the surface temperature of the water. The warmer the water, the less cooling capacity of the engine, so temperatures may rise an additional 5 to 10 degrees. We are now ready to check our visibility. Visibility is critical in proper operation of your boat. We must raise all of our main cabin drapes and open the sliding door located next to the cockpit. This gives the operator more visibility when departing from or arriving into port. As visibility is so important, you should never depart while operating from the flybridge. If you operate from the flybridge, your line of sight extends over the front hull of the boat. You will be seeing only open space instead of the necessary angles needed to steer your vessel from port. We may now return to our main control panel located on the starboard wall in the cockpit area. Certain breakers should remain on at all times when the boat is at dock. These are the refrigerator, if storing food, the ice maker, and the battery charger. The battery charger should always be engaged. It will not overcharge your batteries. It will only charge when battery power is called for. You must always monitor the water level of your batteries. When the boat is in port, the shore power light will be illuminated. This indicates that we are receiving all of our power from the docking facility as the generator is not engaged. In this operating cycle, we can shut down the shore power. Stored shore power will still be available to required sources and will remain for a short while until we engage our generator.
To engage your generator, you must start by depressing the preheat switch, which activates your electronic fuel pump, fueling the carburetor. It also overrides your low oil pressure switch and enables the generator to start. While holding down on the preheat switch, press the start button. You will hear the generator engage. Never start or stop your generator with the main breaker in the on position or under a load. If you crank the generator start switch several times without success, hit the stop button once or twice and this will reset your shutdown switches. Then return to the preheat and hold it down. If the generator does not fire this time, do not continue cranking. Go to the generator hatch and check the unit. The generator has the same switches as those at the remote. You may check for engine flooding or a stuck choke switch. Always replace the breather on the top of the generator as it acts as a spark arrestor. After the power available light comes on, your generator is active. With the power load at a minimum, slide the isolator bar over from shore power to generator power. Remember, your shore power is still available, but with the generator active, you cannot turn the shore power on. You may now go to the starboard station and disconnect your shore power cord and connector, remembering to shut down the breaker before unplugging the boat. By having no shore power engaged, you will eliminate any sparks when you unhook. If you leave your shore power cable at the dock, you should always shut down the breaker. This eliminates a hot cord which could fall into the water. While at this station, you may also unhook your telephone and television cables. All cables should be neatly stored until your return to port. Your dock water reserve is supplied to your craft on the starboard side. Prior to departure, turn on the valve and fill your tanks with a fresh water supply. It is best to fill your tanks prior to leaving instead of several days ahead. This gives you good, clean, fresh water for the duration. Your water tanks are standard twin 80-gallon tanks plus a 17-gallon hot water heater. This will give you an ample supply for an extended cruise. Most marinas have direct water access lines, which you may use as you refuel your craft. When untying your boat from the dock, it is ideal to have three persons handling this procedure. This includes the operator and one person on each side of the vessel. This gives you better stations of view and greater maneuverability when leaving the dock. You should untie beginning at the rear cleats and moving to the front cleats. If only one person is manning the untying procedure, proceed in this manner. Untie the starboard rear cleat, move and untie the port rear cleat, and then move to the front, untying the forward, starboard, and port cleats. The ideal way to fashion your mooring lines once you are at permanent dock is shown here. Make an eye hook with your mooring lines, which can easily be slipped over the cleats on the boat. The other end of the line should be permanently fastened to the docking area. You must allow enough slack in the lines so that the boat may be easily stationed to both the port and starboard sides. By following this procedure, you will spend minimum time with the tying and untying of your boat. It is ideal to leave all main lines secured to the dock. This prevents your boat from becoming cluttered with lines and also prevents them from interfering with the proper operation of your vessel, such as prop interference. Any lines that must be left attached to the boat should be properly coiled and securely fastened. Remember, the fewer knots you have to untie, the easier it will be when preparing to leave the docking area. By keeping your tying system simple, you will have greater success in tying up during windy conditions. Even an inexperienced person can slip the eye hooks over the cleats if they are pre-made and ready to use. If you are experiencing excessive wind, it is very helpful to have at least two persons to help bring the boat into its slip. 
we are now ready to begin our final preparations for leaving port. Make sure the engine hatches are down and secured for increased visibility. In the cockpit area, the operator begins to prepare for exiting the slip. The operator should go to the master control panel and activate 12 volt cockpit supply. This will give us rudder indication and use of the depth finder. As you begin to move, the rudder indicator should be about midship. When you bring the shift levers to neutral, the flashing light becomes a steady light and you are ready for shifting and throttling. You will also hear a sound as the gears engage. Now both engines are in reverse and the craft is backing up. So we need to adjust our rudder depending on the conditions. Always check the aft for other crafts that might be in the area and always be aware of which direction the wind is blowing. The ideal position is with the bow facing into the wind if possible. As you continue backing, you must determine where your swivel point will be. This will vary in all docking facilities. Be sure to give yourself plenty of tail swing room for the length of your boat to come around. Around any marina, you are in a no-wake zone, so keep your RPMs as low as possible. During windy conditions, you may have to keep more RPMs on your engines for maneuverability, but this will vary with different conditions. Always be aware of any other boats in the vicinity. Sometimes they won't anticipate your move, so you have to anticipate theirs. In a twin engine vessel, each engine is totally independent from the other, so you can physically reverse one while forwarding the other for more maneuverability whatever the situation calls for. After you clear the no-wake zone, you should turn off your blower. When your generator reaches a proper operating temperature, you may turn on any additional breakers in the master control panel, such as air conditioning, television, appliances, etc. As you pass different boats and the many coves and openings, be constantly aware of your surroundings. Stay well out of the path of oncoming boat traffic. Remember, you cannot always anticipate what other boaters will do. While you are operating, always be mindful of your gauges, particularly your oil pressure gauge and your fuel gauge. Always remember to refuel when you return to port. This saves you time and effort when preparing for your next cruise. Located at the helmsman station is the spotlight control. Running at night is not advisable. However, if this becomes necessary, this light will be an invaluable resource. If running at night, be sure to utilize your navigation lights. Once you are in open water, you may desire to navigate your boat from the flybridge. In this case, you would bring your engines into neutral and shut off both engines at the ignition switches. You may then proceed to the flybridge and repeat the starting process for both engines as we discussed earlier. By restarting your engines at the flybridge, you may instantly shut down your engines if you experience a drop in oil pressure or a sudden rise in temperature. If you had left the engines on below with the ignition switches activated, you would be unable to shut down from the flybridge. It is always a good idea to start your engines at the location you are operating from. When you complete operations from the flybridge, shut down the engines and restart them in the lower cockpit area. When preparing to return to port, make sure you are operating from the lower level Never enter the no-wake zone from the flybridge. As your view will extend over the hull of the boat, thus causing faulty depth perception. As you enter the no-wake zone, 
you must become more aware of any boats in the area and the fact that each boat is maneuvering at a lower RPM rate. This, combined with the wind, will affect movement. This means you must anticipate sooner what your next move will entail. Remember, if you have been on an extended cruise, check your fuel levels on your engines and generator. This is the proper time to get fuel. If you dock with a full tank, you will get less condensation in your tank. An empty tank will condensate much quicker than a full tank. When approaching the dock and throughout the cruise, you should utilize your UHF radio. You can set your radio to the proper frequency at the master control. It is a good idea to monitor the same channel as your local marina. The marina can inform you of any problems with traffic at the dock, and you can also communicate with other boats, asking for their next movement and for information on the direction in which they are heading. Your ship-to-shore radio is very important. When approaching your slip, wind becomes a critical factor. As we stated earlier, each engine is independent, so you can actually put one in neutral and maneuver with the other, whatever the situation dictates. If the wind is a major factor, you should try your approach into the wind, using the wind at your front instead of permitting the wind to carry you toward the dock or from side to side. When making your final approach to your slip, always making allowance for the wind, give yourself more room to the windward side, always remembering where your swivel point will occur. You must give yourself plenty of tail swing. On a stern drive boat, when you move your steering wheel, you are not only moving your rudders, but you are also moving your thrust. This gives you a lot more response when you're moving your out drives and increases your maneuverability. After we re-enter our slip, our first order is to retie our lines, reversing the order from when we left port. This is where it is handy to have your lines pre-tied so that it is just a matter of capping them over your cleats. Remember to secure the front lines first and the rear lines last. Always use your boat hook when pulling the boat toward you for securing purposes. Now that the boat is secured, we will restore our shore power, our television line, and our telephone cable. Do not reconnect a cord that has become wet. Make sure that it has dried completely so that you will not receive an electrical shock when you reconnect it. After this is completed, we are ready to re-enter the boat and shut down our generator power, remembering not to shut the generator down with a load on. When your generator has been turned off, you still have generator power available. This will remain even after you have slid the isolator bar to restore the boat to shore power. After you remove the load from your generator, it is a good idea to let it set and run in a no load situation for a minute or two. After it has been running under a full load, the carburetor could be loaded up, thus causing flooding. It will flood itself if you shut it down under a full load, so let it cool momentarily before depressing the generator stop button. When you release the stop button, make sure the generator does not refire. You should now check the breakers and cut off all the ones you do not wish to leave active. It is a good idea to leave your battery charge on along with your refrigerator if you are storing food and your ice maker. Be sure to lift the activator bar in your ice maker so that it does not continue to make ice. When the breaker is left on, the ice will not melt. Also, never leave your boat with the supplied water system valve in the on position. 
you will leave it connected to the boat, but never leave the valve open. If the line should rupture, it would fill your hull with water, causing major complications. Lastly, close all drapes to prevent furnishings from becoming faded by the sun. Secure all hatches and locks and leave the boat knowing that everything will be ready for your next cruise. Happy boating! Please write Somerset Houseboats, 5000 South US 27, Somerset, Kentucky, 42501. Or call area code 606-679-9393. The fax number is 606-678-0487.